Is that right? Okay. Well, I'll start with my bucket. Uh, cheapest place to buy buckets in town is firehouse subs. <laughs> you get a lid with it, too. Uh, any th I have a small shop, so I keep a couple of these around. If they're red buckets, it's a trash can. So you got all kinds of buckets around. Uh, Bluebell ice cream, they, they make really good little containers to mix your two-part epoxy if you're just doing a little project. And every now and then you got to go out and eat a little Bluebell just to have an extra lid, so that's, <laughs> that's a benefit. Around my lathe, I put these curtains. I bought them on Amazon or somewhere. They're eight feet tall. I got them on three sides, two sides most of the time, three sides. If you can't keep your shop clean, at least you can try to contain the stuff. And uh, they're relatively inexpensive online. Um, <clears throat> this little gizmo, I don't remember where I saw this or this tip, but uh, if you're either painting or uh, carving on a bowl or wood burning, uh, this is a, it's called a um, stable, stabilizer, and you can put a bowl on either side and it holds it better than the sandbags and everything else you see people doing. I found it very helpful. Where'd you get it? Uh, well, it was in the cabinet above the refrigerator. <laughs> it hasn't been missed yet. <laughs> um, so I took a class at um, the Trinity River, and uh, we were blowing. Um, you stick this in your dye, and you blow, and it's a cheap man's airbrush, I guess. And you got to get right down in there, and then it kind of, you don't know what you're doing. So I got some tubing, and uh, you can do pretty much the same thing, but not have to be right there in the, in the face. So that worked out pretty good. All mine are quick. Um, and those are, though they're atomic, atomic, Atomizer, I believe is how you say that word. I got them, a, yeah. They were at, what, $6, I believe. Um, for my finished work, I always start everything with, um, with sanding sealer. And I think I got this at Woodcraft or Rockler somewhere, and you shake it. You, you can turn it and shake it up. And I just put a little bit on a cloth or whatever. I've got it handy all the time. It doesn't dry up. Uh, when the can's empty, you just throw it away and put another one on it. So, Where do you buy that I think I got it at Rockler or Woodcraft. You just pull this little gizmo, uh -huh. and um, so it it works pretty well. Um, I got some stuff I'm not going to show because we're running kind of long. Last time I was here, I was telling y'all a cheap place to get uh, containers for small when you mix in paint or dye or something. I got accused of going dumpster diving. <laughs> Well, I brought it in a package this time. This is a urine sample container. <laughs> and you can buy them real cheap on, uh, I think it's American Science and Surplus or something. They're like 20 cents each. <laughs> Not when they come in the package. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I brought, that's up to you. Um, when you're on a drill press or something and you're drilling an irregular surface of some sort, um, I find that these um, cornhole bags, you can buy a dozen of them for $10 or something. You can kind of prop them up. You can use them for different props when you're doing different things. And, and I don't know, they're not very expensive, but they're real helpful for something like that. I saw a demo the other night. I think I've shown this before, but I saw a demo the other night. and. Uh, it's kind of awkward, but this is a caliper, I guess. I make one of every size. You do three holes in a piece of plywood, cut it in half. You got two sets. This one's one and seven eighths, and I I have a whole set from half inch to big as uh, Forrester bits would go, I believe. Um, for sanding. Well, like if you're doing a, a, a table leg or something and you're just sizing and you have standard size, you can use your calipers if you want, but you know, you or just whatever. I mean, I use them a lot of times. Not every day, but occasionally. 
when you're doing a sphere uh, and you want it perfectly round, uh, you can put a piece of sandpaper flat on here and kind of use that to, to sand it and go around it. And it makes it, you can get them in any size or just PVC caps. And so they're pretty interesting. Um, I, I had a friend over the other day and John was had an oval skew and I was helping him and I'd never sharpened an oval skew and I didn't know how so I mean because it's round and you kind of awkward so I just got a piece of one by and ran it through a router a couple times laid it on there and it just put it on your platform and it works pretty good for something quick I have a I had an old uh, drill um, cordless drill and it went bad so I took the chuck off of it I've been gonna make a handle for it but I got to find somebody that can do that for me but uh, <laughs> when you're just drilling a, a hole a starter hole for a first um, like if you're doing a hollow form or something you can put different size bits in it you know you can do the same thing with um, ta Morse taper bits or whatever uh, I think John Solberg came up with this a number of years ago and I, I've kind of taken it to another level so to speak but he drilled he showed us how to drill these out and tap them one inch eight or inch and a quarter eight or whatever and this is a I think it's a five ace nine which is for angle grinders and you can get all kinds of stuff at Harbor Freight for angle grinders you can get buffing pads or you can get sandpapers or whatever and uh, when I was at SWAT a couple years ago, I uh, I saw them there. I saw the best wood tools there. They didn't sell them, but he made one for me, and it's it's got the same thread and it's number two Morse taper, and and he only charged like thirty dollars custom made it, and they're really handy to have. Um, even though the other method works fine, but on a Morse taper, you don't have to have a specific size for your lathe, so it works pretty well. I think that's all I have. Uh, if I can get it all back in the bucket, I'll get out of the way. Okay, can you hear me? How many of y'all uh, do some deep hollowing? And uh, if you're like me, it's getting a little harder to see all the time. <laughs> Need more and more light. Well, I've come up with a, a inexpensive way to get a little more light. And what this is, is what's called a COB LED. COB stands for Component on Board. And it's the latest uh, LED type situation. And uh, I've made two or three of them. And can you zoom in a little bit here? Okay. This is probably the brightest one. This is a, a LED board that has all the LEDs are built into the board. They're not discrete uh, lights. And uh, it puts out a lot of light and it gets pretty warm. So I've got a heat sink on the back and I've gone in and board, counterboard for a magnet. And that is set at 15 degrees. And the reason is, if you, most of your tool rest have about a 15 degree slope. So you can snap that on there. And then when you're doing your hollowing, imagine your chuck here and your bowl, whatever you're doing, you can see inside it. So, you know, that's, that's pretty bright. <laughs> and uh, 
This is probably the brighter one. You can actually get too bright. Let me turn that off. That's one that's used uh, in the automotive world uh, as a light on your, your uh, dome light uh, replacement. This is the one I like right here. It's not quite as bright, a little more distributed. And again, got roughly a 15 degree wedge, aluminum wedge in here. And then it's held on with two magnets. And at 15 degrees, instead of angling the light down, it keeps it horizontal. Now these things are expensive. You can buy the lamps themselves. Yeah. For on uh, on Amazon, <clears throat> these things are ten for ten dollars, a buck a piece. And what you do is take and you separate this. And this is made for a uh, License plate light, you can get it open. It's uh, got a T, what's called a T10 base, T10. And you can take an X-Acto knife and slice off the uh, the printer circuit board on each side and if you take this heat shrink off you'll see that there's a resistor in here that allows you to put in 12 volts DC and uh, you can take these two you notice the terminals these two little silver terminals on each end you flip them around flip the other one around and then solder them together and then feed power to those points and uh, that plus your power supply, which is also quite cheap, 12 volts, one amp. And they're run around six, seven dollars a piece. So under 10 bucks, you can have a light like this. What do you search for under Amazon to get those? Uh, T10 COB LED. Does it come with instructions? Hmm? No. <laughs> Do what? Does it come with instructions on how to connect uh, it? <laughs> no. <laughs> and you can put a switch on it if you want to. Uh, on my machine, I've got, I feed 220 to the inverter, but I drop off 110 volts for accessories, for lights and that thing. So just plug it in right there. T10 COB stands for component on board LED light emitting diode. The other thing is a few years ago I'm sure all of you have uh, most all of you anyway have either seen or had a uh, a class with LED as Vera from uh, uh, from uh, Israel, <clears throat> he uses a, uh, and I forgot to bring it, but he uses a uh, support system for finials that uses a, a little cup in your tailstock, four nails, and you wrap a, 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 a string around the four nails and it holds the loose end of your finial will keep it from vibrating. You want one, yeah, let me see yours. <clears throat> Only thing is, so that's the first one that I made. This is uh, and mine. It's made on a uh, 3D printer. 3D printer, right? Okay, this is basically essentially what I've got. Mine's a little larger than than this one, but not quite as big as this one. 
But this will goes in your tailstock. Your uh, finial comes through here, and then your strings. I'm taking your demo. Your strings then, assuming your finial sticking inside here, your strings wrap around the finial like that and holds it in place. And it does a real good job. But I'm always one to try something else. So if you take a number two Morris Taper Arbor, put it in your headstock, and you drill it out to just under three-eighths of an inch. And then depth, you get depth. all the way through. All the way through. And then if you have a, it's really, really handy to have a three-eighths inch reamer. And you can ream it out about a quarter inch deep. Then there is a, then you put a bearing in, which has a little flange on it. This is three-eighths OD quarter inch ID bearing. I don't know if you can see it. It's pretty small. You, if you're lucky enough, you can just lightly press that bearing in place. If not, if your hole's too big, then you've got to put a little bit of sealing around it, Loctite, to hold the bearing in place. Just don't get it on the bearings. And then I took and took a, uh, a little piece of your high density H high, yeah, your high molecular weight plastic and made a little insert that goes in that quarter inch bearing and it has a slight uh, cup in it and you can stick that in your tailstock, stick the tip of your finial in here and use that to hold your finial very 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 low friction so you just touch it and it's it keeps you from if you have a very small finial keeps from twisting it off if you tried it on something like this there's enough force in here enough drag to uh, twist off your finial all right any questions i'm going to pass this around thank you Glenn. Okay, I am going to be very quick, so uh, I only brought one thing, and uh, uh, I didn't bring a grinder, but who, who uses uh, uh, the Wolverine jig system for grinding bowl of gouges? Good, yeah, so do I. Um, it, it's great, it's repeatable and stuff, so I have my gouger, the, uh, the, the grinding jig set up. Um, this arm, it doesn't really ever change. I've got it, I don't, I haven't glued it, but I've got it set up that way. So I have, uh, you want to set your depth of this thing, how it goes, and then you want to set how far the arm wants to go. So I just cut a block of wood. I know that we have these things, you can use the arm. But this length of block now also tells me how far away from the base of the jig and the arm needs to be. So. I have these set up for bowl gouges and my spindle gouge. So just a very simple thing. I was at, uh, I think, one of the Dallas club meetings or open shops, and uh, somebody was talking about sharpening, and I pulled this out and did that, and I put that at my uh, V-arm uh, up there, and I used this to separate the V-arm from the jig, and they went, ha, ah, that's a great idea. So I thought I'd show it. It's very simple very silly thing that I'm sure a lot of you have already done, but if you haven't done it, it's just a way to repeat your, your setup if you go from place to place or, or open shop to open shop. I just bring this with me all the time and it's, it's done. So that's it. That's all I got. I'm just going to lay this here and talk, okay? I wanted something different on finials also, so I took a one-way live center. <coughs> I did two things. And I made this piece 
that goes on there. That goes into the tail stock. I start the finial and get that far, sand it, bring it up. The slightest amount of pressure will cause that to turn. And you've got a solid hold on the end of that end of that finial. From there, you can take it out as long as you want to take it. This one is six inches. I've made them as long as, as 12. And there is absolutely no vibration in the in the finial at all. Now, I got lazy having to put that on there every time. And I had a live center that I didn't, wasn't using. So I made that one, same process, only I just epoxied it to the live center. Now all I've got to do is pick it up and stick it in there. I don't have to worry about this. I made another one of these that actually screws on the end of that. And if you'd like more information about how to make these, just see me at the break or see me afterward and I'll show you how to do it. Okay? They work great.